In part one of my case study on Tom Clancy's The Division, a 2016 RPG shooter by Ubisoft's Massive Entertainment, I looked at the overall structure of the game and its core AI antagonists. As players carve their way through the streets of New York City, they're faced by a variety of roaming and designer-placed AI characters, both friend and foe. An extensive behaviour tree implementation handled decision-making, with many of the attributes used in these behaviours managed courtesy of systems that oversee character factions as well as skill profiles and rankings. But all of this fails to address the larger and more fundamental problem The Division faces. Unlike any game I've covered to date on AI and games, The Division is an online game and requires players to be connected to the internet in order to play it. This requires AI to be executed in such a way that players who are online together have the same experience, fighting the same enemies in a shared world on individual devices. So in part two of my case study on The Division, we're going to explore how the online infrastructure is built to support the non-player characters, how they're created and managed to enable the same experience to all players, and how AI players were used to help test and deploy new parts of The Division during development. If you're not familiar with online infrastructure for games, The Division operates in what we call a client-server model. Each player logs in from their own copy of the game, on their PC or console, which is the client, to a server that's hosting the game. This server hosts what is happening right now in the world of The Division. The active daily and weekly challenges, the world events that are happening, and the in-game economy. Essentially, the entire world of The Division is actually running on the server. And this is where we need to consider the AI in the game's execution. There shouldn't be any discrepancy between what one player in a fire team experiences compared to their friends. If you're being attacked by an enemy character up close but your friends don't see that, it makes for a horrible experience. To resolve that, all AI systems in the game run server-side. None of the behaviour tree AI systems I mentioned in part one are executed on your end. It all happens on the server. This ensures consistency for all players online. But it presents a problem. The behaviour trees only represent the AI decision-making aspect of play, but the player still needs to see it all happen in their game and that requires the characters in the world to execute the decisions made for them on the server. In an effort to minimise the amount of data being passed between player and server, such that the AI can execute smoothly, the animation of all characters is handled purely on the client side, with the AI systems on the server having a very limited understanding of how a given character's animations work, such that it knows which ones to execute, but the client handles it all on their end. Now this solves one problem, in that the data being sent between client and server is kept to a minimum, but it presents another one in the form of NPC movement. All non-player characters in the division use a system of animation-driven locomotion, a more intelligent process of character animation for movement that enables NPCs to move more fluidly and respect the kinematics of their animations. But if the server doesn't monitor the executions, how does it know if a character running towards a destination runs to the correct place? To resolve this, the locomotion systems on the server side calculates a motion plan for characters to move towards, then on client side it has to come up with a movement path based on the actual available animations that character has that will fit the original plan. It sounds nasty, but it keeps the data overhead to an absolute minimum and characters will move where they need to go as smoothly as possible. One aspect that did cause issues was that certain information and events were executed simultaneously on client and server such as NPC turrets being deployed, grenades being thrown, and healing taking place. This is done to cut down the passing of data between client and server, but it means that some information was being synchronised between them at runtime. This synchronisation could explain why there were issues with exploits on the PC build of the game in the opening months after launch, where players modified values in memory to give themselves big health and damage boosts. Now that we have an understanding of how the AI is executed on the server, Let's look at how the game worlds are built and AI is populated throughout the city. Each server used for the division typically houses several instances of the game at once, with potentially up to 1,000 players expected to be playing on a given server during the busiest periods, not to mention thousands more AI to boot. To accommodate for the large number of players and AI characters, the servers at launch had a tick rate of 10 Hz, meaning all behaviours and locations were updated 10 times a second. Now the servers themselves were pretty meaty for 2016. 
40 core machines hosting 256 gigabytes of memory. And with all the optimizations made to the game, including many I don't mention in these videos, they could run an update tick of each game world within less than 20 milliseconds and up to 100 milliseconds in the worst case. Plus, the reduction of continuous data being sent between players and servers meant that the average transfer rate between is only around 50 kilobits per second. In theory, you could run The Division on a 56k modem. Only it's 2018, I imagine most of you don't even know what a 56k modem is, and Massive couldn't even test that theory given you can't run them in Sweden anymore. So the funny thing is, the servers are not what limits the number of AI characters in the game. You are, or rather the console or PC you play on. During development, it was found that consoles created bottlenecks in the number of AIs executing at once, hence there's a limit to the number of non-player characters that can be active in-game at any time. If you've played the story missions, you may have noticed that the game frequently breaks up the fighting with periods of respite of varying length, much of which is addressing the console bottlenecks. Meanwhile, the open world itself sets up zones within which a non-player character is limited to move within if it's been spawned as a roamer or placed in counter. This is largely to ensure NPCs don't wander too far away from their original spawning point, meaning you're not going to bump into last man battalion troops in Times Square, but it also prevents players from creating conga lines of thugs that chase them across the length and breadth of Manhattan. Plus, tied into the navigation and behaviour tree systems is the sensory systems of the AI characters. Non-player characters have both vision cone sensors as well as the ability to hear sounds at varying levels of intensity based on their distance. Plus, they make tactical analysis of which of the 1.5 million cover positions they can go into should combat kick off. The rate at which these sensors update and their accuracy is dependent on both the distance of human players to them, but also the active weather system in the game instance. Hence, bad weather such as rain and snow will impact the range and accuracy of these sensors. Meanwhile, the rate at which senses update scales from every frame, should the enemy be in combat, to every two seconds if the player is between 50 and 150 metres away and sensory updates are outright disabled if no players are within 150 metres of a given character. Now the last thing I wanted to explore was how the non-player character and world systems were tested, but also how AI helped test the division itself. As alluded to in part 1, Massive built a substantial number of tools to enable both designers to build and iterate upon their designs, but also to help the programmers isolate specific issues in the game as they arose. Whilst beyond the scope of this video, Jonas Gilberg's 2016 GDC talk about the tools and systems built by Massive is required viewing for any tool programmers, and a valuable lesson in how to streamline development for production teams of all sizes. The testing tools built enabled full debugging of a behaviour tree as it was operating, but the most impressive part was the potential to test these tools in simulated live instances. The debug toolchain enabled for local servers to be deployed to simulate the behaviour of a live instance and not just identify where issues arise, but roll back the timeline of behaviours during the test to understand when they were occurring. But perhaps the most interesting, or rather amusing, aspect to this testing process was ensuring that each mission was complete, valid and stable. When building games of any scale, it's possible for small bugs to deny progression between mission segments or fail to trigger specific in-game events that are required. So, Massive built testing facilities that enabled for hundreds of AI characters to act as players and be dropped into testing servers to run around and, well, effectively play the game like you would, just run into areas of the map and kill everybody. Up to a thousand AI players would be dropped into the map, but they had all sorts of hacks and modifications enabled. They didn't respect physics, and could walk and even shoot through walls if necessary, and could move between two locations in the world without any real consideration for normal navigation. Either individually or in groups, they could fan out and complete whole segments of missions or just explore the open world. They had no real understanding of what they were doing, other than wandering around and killing things that they should be killing, but this thousand monkeys with typewriters approach helped profile and bug test many aspects of server loads, mission progression, world events, dynamic encounters, and much more. Which in a way is sort of depressing, <laughs> so I reevaluate all the time I spent in that game. With the release of The Division 2 not far off, it'll be interesting to see how these systems have scaled up and improved between projects. It was evident as The Division continued to be updated throughout its life cycle, 
with the likes of paid DLC such as the Underground Survival and Last Stand, as well as the many free updates throughout the last year or so, th there was plenty of interesting opportunities still available in that core design. Naturally, many existing AI systems would expand and improve over this time, and perhaps some new ones even came to the fore. But for now, the secrets behind their development are still a mystery, but you can bet that the Division will be back on the show in the future. But for now, thanks for watching these case studies on Tom Clancy's The Division, and if you enjoyed them, don't forget to give them a wee like and subscribe to the channel as well. I want to take a moment to give special thanks to my Division squad mates, Jack Thompson, Matt Syrett and Pauline Fimister, who you've seen fighting alongside me throughout the last two videos. It's also Pauline and Jack's debut, if you will, on the show. Well, Matt's been helping to record co-op gameplay ever since my videos on Left 4 Dead and Battlefield 3. You can expect to see them pop up again in some future episodes I've planned, where I repeatedly just drag them onto whatever game I'm playing for the sake of looking like I'm playing a multiplayer game with friends. Plus, a special thank you to my patrons on Patreon.com who continue to support my work here on AI and Games via the links on screen now and in the description. This year, I've released 15 case study videos spanning everything from Total War to Sure Footing with a little bit of Doom in the middle. And without them, this would not have been possible. 2018 has been a stellar year, but with their help, I'm moving forward into 2019 to celebrate AI and Games' fifth birthday. In the meantime, wishing you all a happy holidays, and I'll be back with more AI and Games goodies next month.